The topic of our workshop is illness and recovery and it looks like it. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> topic of our workshop is illness and recovery and Shannon is gonna go first. Hey everybody, I'm Shannon, I'm an addict. Hey Shannon. Um, times of illness. Thinking about this a lot, because um, I've been pretty sick for about half of my recovery, the time that I've been in recovery, so um, I was hoping to see a few more younger people in here, because by the time we get our age, we already know <laughs> we're going to have to deal with some some illness at some point, but I was thinking about when I first came in, you know, being young and, and thinking I was invincible and, you know, really didn't worry about those kind of things, um, about getting sick or what I would do if I got hurt and, and needed to uh, have some treatment. And um, But I think it's important that we do learn about it, about it early on because as we get older, it's, it's, gonna, it's coming, you know, at some point. We're going to get sick or we're going to get hurt from some unfortunate accident or for whatever reason. And being able to deal with those situations can, can be a struggle for us sometimes. I know it, it has been for me over the years. Um, you know, and I've, I've tried different ways of, of setting myself up for it. And, um, you know, I believe in and letting the healthcare professionals know where we're at and, and what we got going on. Um, however, I have found that sometimes that can be a double-edged sword um, with some healthcare professionals are a little bit too cautious. Mm -hmm. and, and I've found that sometimes when we do need something, they're a little reluctant to, to give it to us. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be hard sometimes. I know for me, uh, it. I try to, you know, when I have, a, let's say I'm dealing with some pain, I will try to avoid any type of pain medication. And sometimes I'll try to do it for too long. And then the next thing I know is I find myself in a position where it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I haven't been able to sleep for two or three days because of the pain, and I'm thinking about going to the liquor store, you know, just because I need some relief. Mm. And I don't think that that's a safe place for us to be either. Um, so over the years, I've, I've found to, that it's a lot easier for me to work with my health care professionals, tell them where I'm at and what I need. And that I guess that's probably the most important thing is being up front with my doctors and letting them know, you know, what I need, what I can handle and what I can't. And then keeping my circle of recovery people well informed of where I'm at and what I'm doing and um, so that I've got someone to hold me accountable. I mean, it's one thing to see my doctor every other week whenever I have a follow-up or whatever if I'm going through something um, and be able to maintain for an hour or so while I've got a doctor's appointment, but I need to be accountable with some people that I see a little bit more regular that can keep an eye on me because uh, I've had struggles with that in my recovery. Um, I'd probably been about five years clean when I had to have my first surgery um, that required some medication and um, you know and I did everything that everybody told me to do you know I let everybody know what I what I was doing what the doctor had prescribed me um, at the time I was still living with my parents and so my mother was my gatekeeper <laughs> you know so um, and I sure wasn't going to talk her out of anything after all the problems she'd had with me. <laughs> so <laughs> she knew better, you know. Uh, and uh, so I, and that was after about five years clean, and and I got through that. And, um, you know, didn't really have to deal with anything else for for a while. Um, 
until I got um, around 97, uh, found out that I had hep C. <clears throat> and um, at this point, I'm just kind of tired all the time, don't feel good, um, didn't really know what was going on, and, um, you know, started uh, going to the doctor to try to figure out what was what was happening at the time. Um, it wasn't something that was mainstream news uh, for hep C at that time. It was just people were just starting to find out about it, and they were just starting to try to find ways to treat it. And um, I found out that I had it. Um, started treatment with with a doctor in Atlanta, and um, struggled with that for up until this past year, um, July. Let's we'll see, uh, yeah, July, I finally was cured of the hep C with the new treatment, Harvoni. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in, in the process of that, um, during that time period of all the treatments, I was on eight, eight different treatments before I finally got one that worked for me. And um, during that time period, I developed stage four cirrhosis. Uh, which causes some pain um, in the liver and uh, I really struggled with that for a long time and um, talked to my healthcare professional about it and you know got some low dose pain medication <laughs> to help me just knock the edge off and um, and at this time I was doing good I had um, probably uh, 15 years clean at this at this point. Um, was working a program, doing everything I needed to be doing in my recovery, and um, so I, I guess the thing that I I really want to say is that I might not can tell you a, a whole lot about what to do, but I can tell you what not to do in times of illness. And um, so, um, had started having to take some pain medication on a fairly regular basis to keep that that under control. And um, over about a five year period, I stopped going to meetings. It's just the first thing I did. It seems to be the first thing everybody does. I don't know why we have to keep repeating that people but that's the way it happens that's usually the way it starts and um, I started uh, not going to meetings and, and then one thing after the other over about a five to seven year period just started chipping away the disease did everything that I'd ever did for my recovery to keep me in check was gone by the end of that time period and um, <clears throat> praying, I wasn't praying anymore, I wasn't talking to anybody in recovery and I had a really tight network of people in recovery. I'd been clean at this point for about 20 years so um, I knew a lot of people, I've been involved in service, uh, a lot of service work um, from the regional level on down and I had a really close network, I had more friends than I'd ever had in my entire life. And um, at the end of that five or six year period, I found myself pretty much alone, you know. Not because of what anybody else did, but what I had done mm -hmm. for myself. Um, and separated myself from the program. People would call me you know, that I had known for 20 years in recovery, you know, and I would see the number come up on my caller ID and I'd see just how quick I could hit the end button and send them to voicemail, you know, mm -hmm. and then I would very rarely call them back, you know. Um, and I, I was in a marriage at the time that I was struggling with, um, 
and really I was just struggling with my whole life I mean you know uh, when I was working a program and needed what I needed and was doing what I needed to be doing for my recovery all was fine and dandy you know I mean life was good man I mean I had uh, my life had improved a hundred times more than what I'd ever thought it would when I first walked in the doors, you know. Um, I was just a guy barely doing anything more in the plant that I worked in than sweeping the floors, you know. And by the time this 20 years has come up, I'm flying around in a corporate jet working for the, the corporate office. Um, you know, I never would have imagined any of those things for myself, you know. And all that was a result of just a little application of, of the program you know it doesn't take much and uh, we have to stay on top of it and um, you know part of that process of flying around the country and working for the corporate office was another reason I stopped going to as many meetings you know um, I'd be out of town I'd find whatever excuse you know to not go to a meeting well I don't know anybody or you know, I don't have time, uh, you know, and it, it just, it's, when we say this disease is insidious, you know, it, it really is. I mean, it, it's way smarter than I ever gave it credit for, you know, because uh, it just took these things away from me a little bit at a time. And, you know, I was relapsing long before I ever started abusing my meds um, and and that is eventually what happened you know after five years of of not doing what I needed to do for my recovery and being sick all the time and um, you know that's about all there was left for me to do you know I was doing everything all the behavior of my addiction was there you know, except for the using. I mean, I was doing everything I did before I walked in the door when I finally picked up, you know, and it, it was, you know, not that it was the only alternative, but at the time, you know, because I was weak in my program, for me, that was the only alternative, you know. It was readily available. It was right there at my fingertips. All I had to do was pick up, and, um, and I did. And... Um, You know, so now I've been back because uh, April will be seven years. So I'm grateful to be back and back clean again and doing what I need to be doing for my recovery. And uh, and I'm grateful that that I made it through all that. You know, and, and um, you know, I guess that was the most important thing for me to be able to share was you know uh, what not to do, and that's to not work your program and do what you need to be doing for your recovery. When you're, it's even more important when we're sick to be more diligent in our recovery than it is when we're healthy. Um, you know, it's easy to do it when we're, every, life's grand and everything's going good, you know, but, but when, you, when you feel bad and you're sick or you're hurting, it, it gets more difficult to take care of ourselves. and. Um, you know, for me it was a hard lesson learned, but but it's one that I I'm grateful for now. You know, because I have that experience, and I'm grateful that I that I made it back. You know, um, and hopefully, you know, somebody else won't have to experience that the way that I did. But you know, that's the truth of the matter. Is we get we get older, um, we get hurt, we get sick. And at some point, we're going to have to deal with it. And it's just like everything else in our recovery. We have a choice in the way we want to deal with it. And the best way is through working the steps and keeping your network of recovery friends close at hand and, and letting everybody know where you're at and what you're doing and what you need. You know, I struggled with that sometimes, too, was telling people what I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, I got it. I got it. I can do it. You know, I don't need anybody's help. No, you don't need to bring me some soup. I'm, you know, 
even something that simple sometimes is can make you feel better, <laughs> you know. But um, I'm real grateful to to be here and, and be able to to share in this workshop and um, turn it over to the next person, to Karen. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Karen. I'm crying and I haven't even opened my mouth yet. Um, I'm a recovering addict. My name is Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, Karen. There must be something. I, I, I had dinner with a group of people last night, and the lady had 24 years, and she relapsed, and she's been back five. Now you're saying 20, and, so, and I'm like, I, I, I'm going to not take that as just a coincidence. And I'm on my fourth step. So anyway, so... Shannon said he wanted to share first, and I was like, that's cool, you know, because I, because me, I did the same workshop last week in Greenville, so I was going to say, well, we take a group conscience, and we decided to make this sex and recovery instead, because it's so much more fun. <laughs> I'm now the it girl for, for, um, for illness and recovery, and, you know, I, I remember for years going, seeing this workshop on the schedule, and saying, I'm so glad I don't have to go there. And now I do, and that's not a bad thing. I'm just amazed how many of us have gray hair in here, <laughs> or no hair. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> or pulled it out, whatever. Um, there you go. Um, and and when we were sitting here, when they were doing the readings, like these thoughts came to my mind, and I'm like, no, you went outside and you prayed to God, use you as a vehicle to say what needs to be said, stop thinking about stuff. So hopefully my brain is empty right now. Um, so, you know, I had, I've had things come up over the years in recovery just because I'm here. And, you know, it was always about telling my, my doctor what, it, you know, I was in recovery. And there was one time where um, it was my stomach doctor and he put me on some new meds and I passed out at work. I just like fell asleep for like three hours. So I called him and I go, there's something wrong with this medicine. I fell asleep for three hours. He goes, oh, it has, I don't want to name this, but it had something in it I shouldn't have been taking. And I'm like, I told you I'm in recovery. And what that taught me was just because they're doctors doesn't mean they understand what recovery is. And that it's my, I have to educate them what that means for me. And thank goodness, Gary Dreyfus and I worked together at the time. And I went running into Gary and I said, oh my God, I took this pill. Did I relapse? But he said, no. But now you know what's in it. If you take another one, now it's a relapse. And we had this like one little bitty bathroom. Like it didn't even have the, the sink in it. It was just the toilet. And Gary and I went in there. And we threw the pills down the toilet together. And the thing that I know, you know, that, that was a really big one for me. Um, I had to have something else done. And I was not going to be mobile for many, many weeks. And gratefully, a friend was willing to let me stay with her. Here's the thing I've learned. I can accept help with humility or with humiliation. And the only difference is the experience the person that's helping me is going to have. Because I'm the one, I'm the one always there for everybody. I'm the one always helping everybody. I'm the, I'm the, and you know what? You know, when people said, well, yeah, but you're always there for everybody else. It's your turn. I don't want it to be my turn. <laughs> but you know what? It was. And, and the truth is, when I had that first thing, with the first surgery with my foot, I wasn't, I, I didn't accept the health, help with, humi with humility at first. I, I really didn't. And I feel bad for the way people, you know, I made people feel because I, I needed that help. You know, I'm still writing my gratitude list. I've been writing a gratitude list every morning for nine years of at least three non-material things I'm grateful for from the previous day. And, I, and, and I'll get to this, but I better say it now while it's still in my head because I figure, well, what the drugs didn't do, menopause kicked, and then the two cells that were left, chemo killed. So if I have something to say, i got to say it on the spot because it may never come back again. Or at least I may be at like two in the morning. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So... 
so. And there it goes. <laughs> anyway, and I'm sure it was just awesome. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, oh, about the gratitude list. So, I don't know. But I can tell, oh, I know what it was. When I was going through chemo, it was pretty rough. It's like anybody ever had easy chemo. Like that is even a possibility. However, I know that the one thing for me was I was able to write my gratitude list every day. As sick as I was, as bald as I was, as weak as I was. So, you know, me and God have had this thing back and forth. You know, my dad died really young. My mother died really young and didn't have much use for God after that. Came back. Came, oh, see, I must have hit the table because that thing's blinking. Sorry. Um, I'll stay away. Um, me and God have had this dance. And I, and I feel like, in a way, the relationship that I built with my higher power was getting me ready for the big one. And so, I mean, and, and you know, it doesn't matter what I had because I don't want to say what I had and then somebody think, well, I didn't have that, so she doesn't, she's not talking to me. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what we used. It doesn't matter for me what I had. But I wasn't ready for the diagnosis when it came because I knew how busy I was and I knew that my God knew how busy I was and he wasn't going to let me get sick because I didn't have time. Well, so... He decided he wanted me to work on my time management skills, and so therefore I got this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that felt that my whole recovery was getting me ready for this. And I can't explain why. I, 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 okay, so at one time I thought my whole recovery was getting me ready for the second husband, but that didn't work out either. <laughs> <laughs> I said he was the gift of my recovery, and they're like, yeah, but he was a gang gift. And, then, <laughs> and it was the third one either, so I'm like, okay, now doctors say, what are you allergic to? I say marriage. And, I, and then I talk about the medical stuff, and then I find out how, what kind of sense of humor they have. So, you know, I really don't remember a whole lot when I first got diagnosed, to be honest, because it was such a shock. But when I, came, when I came to, I guess, or, you know, whatever, when I, when I realized, here's what I realized. My God knew how it was going to turn out. Worry was not going to change it. And, and I had been doing this gratitude list for all these years. And if I'm, I don't know about you, I have never worried about anything and have the outcome change. Mm -hmm. And I knew my God gave me gifts every day because I'd been writing this gratitude list every day. So I just did what I had to do. And I didn't get, I didn't get enmeshed in that. You know, I learned something actually outside the rooms of recovery, and it was that everything in life is a reason or an excuse. And I can tell you coming in here, and because of my background, I used what I'd been through before recovery as an excuse to manipulate, to get my way, to get out of, to get into, to get around, whatever. And I learned in recovery that I could use anything that's put in my path as a reason to elevate myself and to elevate the experience into something. I, I don't, this is really interesting why that rang. You know why it rang? This is so amazing. I ran into a woman at the grocery store last week that I had met at Starbucks. And she told me twice a day, she sets the alarm at times where she's usually stressed and she stops and she thinks of something to be grateful for at that moment. Isn't that like the coolest thing? And I remembered by the time I got home to do it, which is even more amazing. So that was my four o'clock reminder to think of something to be grateful for. I'm telling you, like, Everything gets put in my path at the exact way I need it. It's just unbelievable. So I didn't feel like when I got this diagnosis, I was being punished. I was bad. I didn't make my amends right. This was like, you know, I never looked at it like anything like that. The way I looked at it was... I have this God that knows me better. I hope the word God doesn't bother people. If it does, think good orderly direction, think higher power. I apologize. Um, but I, I had, I, I, and it wasn't in an egotistical way, but I had this feeling that my God knew me well enough. He knew I wasn't just going to have this illness and let it go and like get through it and that's it. I wanted it to be purposeful for me. 
And the way I made it purposeful for me turned out to expose me to people all over the place. All over. Because I started a blog and I keep asking people to give me to give me a filter for Hanukkah and nobody does, so it's still if it's here, it comes out. So it comes out in my mouth, it comes out in my hand, you know, my writing. And so I just blogged everything. I blogged every emotion, every thought, every feeling, and they weren't all pretty and they weren't all nice. Sometimes I just wished somebody was there to hold me so I wasn't alone. And that's okay to say. You know, yeah, my God is there and all that, but you know what? Sometimes you just want to be held when you're waiting to find stuff out or when you, you know, whatever. But then on the other hand, there's people that are in marriages and there's, or relationships and, this, and this, uh, the partner leaves for whatever reason, male or female or, you know, other stuff. So, you know, I, I try to learn to be stronger and to, to give myself more things than I had given myself before. So... Okay, so well, this is sort of going to come out like what I had, but it's okay because I have this really sick sense of humor. And, and I find the good in things that people are going, huh, and I find the humor in things, and I had to have a double mastectomy. I opted for a double mastectomy, so I never want to go through this again. And I had a ta ta to the ta ta's party three days before. <laughs> it's okay, guys, you can laugh, it's okay, I said it. <laughs> And you know what? I, the one thing I didn't want is I didn't want it to be solemn. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be sad. And it wasn't. I, like, I asked, and Sharon is sitting here. When you said about your friends, you know, you stay here. And, and for me, my God just kept putting every piece in place that I needed even before I knew I needed it. So I decided I needed to have a theme song for my illness, <laughs> for my journey. So she, and I put it out on Facebook like I do everything else in the world. And I, you know, I, got a, I got a living fifth step on there. So when I'm 80 and I don't remember something, I can go back and go, oh, my God, I did that? How cool. I have no idea who it was me. But, you know, I go back and I can do that. You know. So anyway, so I, I put it out on Facebook. I said, okay, I need a theme song. And Sharon came up with the idea of the Pharrell song, Happy. So every morning, because, you know, I'm an addict and I'm like OCD, so I found it where it was played over and over again for like three hours. Mm -hmm. And I would get up in the morning and i put it on and I would do it. And, you know, I, I just lived my life. And I, and, I, and I didn't feel like I was a victim. As a matter of fact, it's sort of funny, about three months, three months after, um, I found out I was, well, af I was, I, I, I get confused. <laughs> Shocking. Um, but... I, ha I wanted to go to an arts festival, and so these women were going to take me, but I couldn't walk, so somebody lent me a wheelchair. Was my hair purple? Yeah, my hair yes. was purple then. I was like, yeah, I was 56 years old at the time, <laughs> and I was about to lose my hair, and I'm like, you know what? I'm 56, and I have a professional career. I said, this, I am never going to be able to have spiked purple hair again in my life. And I never had the guts to do it when I was younger because I was a daddy's girl, and he wouldn't have liked it. So I did it. And so somebody lent me, somebody lent me a wheelchair, and we got to go to this arts festival, and we did the locomotion song. They, they all, I got in a line, and we did it through Piedmont Park. It was so cool. So the woman that lent me the wheelchair brought it over, and she said, she was sitting outside and she looks at me and she goes, Karen, so what's your prognosis? I said, I don't know, I didn't ask. I said, I never consider dying. I just, I'm a very prescriptive person. This is the problem, tell me what to do, I do it and we go on with life. And, you know, you get sick and things happen. People don't know what to say to you, so they walk away. And, and, Here's the kicker about this. This is the kicker about this whole process, about somebody walking away or, or not showing up or, you know, disappointing and all that. Here's the kicker about all that. I was that person that did every single thing that happened to me. And I'm not proud of it, but I have a, I have a complete different experience now when I hear something happens to somebody that I was I was that person that didn't always show up or didn't know what to say 
And so I, I just walked away and I know how that feels. And you know what? I did go through those feelings of being angry and hurt and disappointed. But here's the thing, you know, like in recovery, they tell us we got to get away from the people that aren't healthy or, you know, using buddies and things like that. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do without them? What's my life going to be like? I know I'm a little bit dramatic. I'm a, I am a recovering drama queen, but I'm obviously having a relapse. <laughs> so... <laughs> And I crack myself up. Um, so, <laughs> so here's the thing. Recovering drama queen. Oh, we, no, no, no. About oh, about the people leaving. Oh, so when we had to let go of these people, we didn't want to let go in our life, and we didn't know what was going to happen. What happened? They were replaced, right? The same thing happened to me on this journey. The people that weren't there, for whatever reasons, they couldn't be. People stepped up that, A, I didn't know, mm -hmm. B, I knew, and I'm like, oh my God, I've known this person 15 or years or whatever amount of years, I can't believe they're here for me. And again, you know, am I a, is it a reason or is it an excuse? And I will tell you, okay, I don't know what time I started. I looked at it, R wound up, okay. So, no, keep, no, I'll keep, keep going, talking. okay. This has been the most amazing, incredible, empowering experience I never would have prayed for. Plus, at the end, I got boobs that I would put up against any 20-year-old in this convention. And I didn't have to pay for them. Humana footed the bill. <laughs> the only bad thing... <laughs> And Scott's going, oh my God, I can't believe she just said that. I know I did, Scott, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, the thing about the doctors, when you said that, I thought, oh my gosh, I had this um, reconstruction surgeon. I drove them all nuts. I really drove them all nuts because I had my surgery on a Tuesday. I came home on Sunday, and Monday I had 19 years clean. I was not going to lose that time. I was just not going to lose it. And I drove my doctors crazy, and, and my one surgeon in particular, because it's a very... It's what he did was very painful, not the whacking off. That was nothing. After what they do is worse. And I kept saying, you know, this and that. And every he'd, when I go to see him beforehand, he go, I know, I know, drugs and all that stuff. And, you know, he, he usually does something is very standard for him to do after the surgery the next day. I didn't know that, but I didn't get it. And... Um, I did. I got like the lowest amounts of anything, and when it when it was worse. But but part of it was honestly, I've been told this by my doctors. This isn't anything I'm saying that sounds positive and good. It's not me. It's just this much willingness to let all of this program, to let the program work in my life, and to watch people like Scott and so many others before me walk through things and seeing they can do it. I can do it, and. Another thing was, and I know this isn't all coming together the way it probably would, it, it is what it is, is that I took my higher power wherever I went. So, like I was going into a doctor and I was scared. I'm standing up for the tape recorder. You know how you're standing, you're walking down the hall and you're holding someone's hand? When I'd walk into the doctor's appointments, I held my higher power's hand. And I had somebody that came with me, but I always held my higher power's hand. And um, that made a huge difference. My relationship with my higher power really helped me. And I know there's people that get sick and they're like, you know, you know, the heck with God and this and that. That wasn't my story and that wasn't my experience. I can tell you that, I think I said it, but I'll say it again. I never, there was not a day I couldn't find gratitude. Because here's the thing, sometimes I would lay there and I would feel like the world's going by. And I would feel like I was forgotten. Like everybody's, you know, I read Facebook, you know, it's, it's the devil and the angel all in one. Um, you know, I, I would see, you know, they're at this party and they're doing this and this one's going on vacation. And I'm laying here and it's a good day if I could walk down the stairs 
And I felt so many times that, you know, I was forgotten and, you know, everybody's moving on and they're sick of hearing me because I was sick for a long time. And then I had the chemo and, you know, that's just a whole other thing in itself. And I felt like people got tired of hearing it. And then I would get a text from somebody or I would get somebody would write something on my Facebook page. When you're laying there by yourself, that's that's everything. That's, for me, that was everything. And, and for that moment, I knew somebody in the universe had thought of me. So now when there's people I know that are ill, I'll just send them a text. I, I, you know, I really want what I, what I want to do is start sending out handwritten cards again. Because I had a friend that did that for me the whole time I was sick. Like, they always seem to come exactly on the right day. And... Um, I want to get back into doing that because I used to do it uh, like a thousand years ago. But if you're pushing your friends away, my experience and strength and hope is be grateful for them. They're there because they want to be. I'll just say this and hopefully I won't think of anything else and I'll shut up. So, (laughs) but God only knows. So, after my surgery, okay, so I went, the morning of my surgery, there was this um, bench outside the hospital, and so we met there, Sharon met, and Alan picked me up, and Sharon met me there, and I had a, a, a was it a tiara. tiara, I wore a tiara and a purple feather boa, oh. and we sang the song Happy, and we made a video, <laughs> and then after the surgery, you know, you got to walk around right away, so I wore my boa, and I had a, like a big Dr. Seuss hat, and I had the tiara, and I wore frog slippers, and these um, pajamas with these big pink polka dots, of course, now I hate the color pink. I used to love it. <laughs> I wish I could fall asleep September 30th and wake up November 1st. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Off, off, off subject. But anyway, and I just did that. And I just, you know, actually I went downstairs one day. Some friends came over and went to Starbucks. And these people were looking at me. I go, no, there's not a psych ward here. <laughs> because I looked like I was crazy. But I just figured if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And you know what? I, it's like I said, you know what? I have cancer. I can do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> and whatever it is that you got, do whatever the hell you want. I mean, that, I figured that's, that's, my, that's my ticket now. And, you know, I can say whatever I want and do whatever I want within reason. I mean, I, I've, I've pulled myself back a little bit. But this isn't the room any of us want to be in. But are you going to be, are you going to make it an excuse or are you going to use it as a reason? I mean, and we all have that choice. I mean, believe me. I wish we didn't even need this workshop, but at the end of the day, we do, and we're not alone. And it doesn't matter. One's got hep C, and one's got breast cancer, and one's got... It doesn't matter. We didn't care what drugs you use. What do you want to do about your illness, and how can we help? That's it. That's our message. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about, you know, somebody... um, I will say this, and hopefully shut up, really. Um, A woman found out yesterday that her cancer came back and she said it took me 12 hours to write this because I didn't want to disappoint any of you that had been praying for me. I'm like, you're too fabulous to disappoint us because you're too busy inspiring us. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about. Just, you know, okay, so we are sick people. We're, we're not, we're not good pe- bad people trying to become good, just like it says in the basic text. We're sick people and we may not get well, but that doesn't mean we can't live wonderful lives, be of, have a purpose, get up, in the, get up in the morning and have a reason to be and to take, I take what's, what I went through and I don't care who, who's got what, I'm like, I'm like the it girl for illness and recovery. Everybody call, I want to be the it girl for sex and recovery. I don't know if this is what I got to do as a springboard, I'm willing, but you know, everybody that knows somebody that got sick, I hear about it. They tell me, and you know what? That's what I do. Even when I was sick, I was still trying to help people on the days I felt good to be there. And you know what? If you're sick and you're really struggling, you're having problems, the littlest things become so grateful. I don't take for granted the fact that I can step into a shower and that I can even have the water come out of the spigot because there was a time I couldn't even do that. 
you know, the little, if, if, you're, if you're struggling, if you're feeling sad, write that gratitude list. The tiniest thing, it's, it's, so, it, it's so empowering. It's so empowering. And um, if there's anything I can do for anybody to, um, you know, cheer you up or stay the hell away from you because I'm way too positive. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I did have some magnets made when I got, when I got sick. And they're pur- I love purple and butterflies. And they say you are special, so be good to yourself today because we forget we're special and we forget we can still be good to ourselves. And I brought a bunch, so if anybody would like one afterwards, please let me know and I'd be happy to give it to you. So thanks for letting me share. Thanks, Thanks, Karen. Does anybody like to share? Can can you come up? Yeah, you'll have to come up. We're going to put a chair over here so you can be recorded. Okay. My name's Scott. I'm an addict. Hey, Scott. And since the very day I got clean, I got clean as a result of a congenital eye disease. I couldn't see. And uh, since that time, I've had 14 surgeries on my eyes. I have had, uh, uh, you know, I know every... uh, eye surgeon in Georgia by the first name pretty much it feels like sometimes and it you know it ebbs and flows it's some some days I see real well other days I don't see so well and here a couple years ago I had a real problem and now I can't drive anymore which is a real uh, it's an inconvenience but there are people in NA who will come to my house and get me and take me to meetings no. So I come to meetings. The worst time I have had since I got clean had nothing to do with my eyes, nothing to do with the fact that I have heart disease and uh, COPD and all this stuff. When I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic and the, uh, my primary care physician said, I'm going to have to put you on insulin and you're going to have to give yourself injections. Now, I had been clean over 30 years when that happened. But it scared me to death. It just scared the holy hell out of me. Because I don't, I, you know, I, I was a needle junkie. I mean, I, I just, that's just my story. And, um, I was so frightened and so scared that at one point I was thinking, well, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to do that. But that's impractical. It's also silly, and it also, as far as I'm concerned, demonstrated a lack of faith in my higher power. But uh, so I reached out to people in the program, you know. And, and one of the things, and, and, and this is just an observation, and it may just be me and the way I see things may be twisted, but one of the things that seems to happen is if you've been clean for a while, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be able to leap over buildings in a single bound faster than a speeding bullet, have the solution to any problem. <laughs> That is crap. Take my word for it. I know. Um, but people came to my house. We had a meeting at my house, an NA meeting. And I talked to people about how scared I was. And the fact that, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I, had not had, I had not had a syringe in my hand uh, or, or been around one except when I got my flu shot. Uh, or some of the medication that uh, you had to inject in my eyes. I, you know, I'd not been around syringes and, and needles and alcohol sponges and all that. So how the hell I was never around alcohol sponges when I was using, but uh, I had all this stuff at home. And it scared me, and I didn't know what to do. And I reached out to people in the fellowship. I prayed. I did the things that people told me to do when I first got clean. 
if you want to stay clean, this is what you do. And that's what I did, you know. And it went away. It did go away overnight, but it did go away. You know? And I do will admit this, I do feel, I don't know, a little embarrassed or a little uh, whatever. I can't put a word to the feeling that I have when, I, when I'm at an NA convention and I know that, that <clears throat> every five or six hours I'm going to have to run upstairs, draw up some insulin and stick it in myself. I feel, you know, but uh, I just, uh, the program works. It works for anything, I think. Any problem that I'm having. And, uh, you know, the fact that I'm a diabetic and I have syringes at my house and I stick them in me sometimes. Uh, I'm okay with that. It doesn't scare me. It does and I, I I really did think I'm gonna bring these things home. I'm gonna open the package, it's the watch as a box. I'm gonna open the box and then run right out and rob a drugstore. <laughs> but you know <laughs> that didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. 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 I'm Donna, I'm an addict. Hey, hey Donna. Donna. I had a feeling today when I was looking at this that I was really supposed to be here. Like I just, like sometimes I get this sense that I'm directed to a certain place. And I really related to the not expecting the diagnosis thing because I just, I just received diagnosis that's particularly terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. um, I had just had foot surgery, like I'm on my third month, still limping a little bit. I also have an auto-inflammatory illness. And, um, you know, I have flare-ups and whatever, but during the end of a flare-up, I experienced some pretty severe chest pain. And I went into the ER and, but you know, I could see my higher power even looking back just in this short of a time into it. And um, they usually don't do a CT scan with contrast with someone with chest pain, but they did one for me and they found an aortic aneurysm, mm -hmm. like an ascending one, which means it's right on the top of my heart, right where the valve is coming off. And um, you know, when I first she said that to me, I was like, it just, it bounced off, it, like it bounced off. Like th that, huh? That's not me. And it took, it's taken, it's still taking a minute for that to settle in, that that really exists in my body. And like laying at night and feeling so fearful and um, so, but what I did initially <sighs> through the fear and whatever is I started letting people know in my network, this is what's going on, I'm really afraid. There's two immediate family members, one died, like fell dead at the dinner table and my mother just had a tear in hers and had open heart. Um, so it's a strong genetic component apparently, but I've been feeling some kind of way about this because apparently the treatment is watchful waiting. In other words, they don't just go in there and operate on it. They wait for it to get a certain size because the surgery is so dangerous because a lot of people don't, it's just, it's nasty. Mm -hmm. And me being in the medical profession for 20 years, I know how nasty that is and that's terrifying too. So, you know, what, what I really, I have, my partner has been a great strength in this because I believe God put the people in my life that I need right now. And she's like, you know, I believe your foot surgery was for a reason. I see that that really made you slow down. Like, I have been frantic my whole life, even in my recovery. Business, do this, do that. I got to be on a time, some imaginary time schedule. I don't know where I got this in my head that this exists, but it does to me. And, um, you know, since all that's happened, at first it was fear. There's still fear. But it turned into, this might be the last beautiful sun thing that I see. You know, this might be this, and this might be that. And it has made me slow way down and learn what it means to be in the moment. Because not the next one's not really promised. I mean, it's not promised for anybody. But it, it, it just, it, I've experienced this experience with my higher power about the, the beauty in, in the things and really seeing life right there. The joy of my crazy dogs and my kids and the people 
that just the simplest little things have become so special to me. You know, it, it could be that it stays stable and I live to be a ripe old age. It could be not. It's that waiting and not knowing. I mean, I'll walk around going, oh, my God, what is that? Well, it's indigestion. Oh, my, thank God. This is my <laughs> Just, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be so hyper vigilant that I lose. You know, there's a balance. There's a balance. And I'm at the point of figuring it out. So I've really increased my going to meetings by letting people in my, you know, network really know this is some hard stuff. This is hard stuff. I mean, the auto-inflammatory is a chronic genetic illness, but yeah, it's under, that's managed relatively okay. The thing that's scary is that inflammation makes vessels weaker. So it's like, that's not a good thing to have with this. It's, uh, and I can awfulize the whole thing, but the bottom line is, Life and death are not in my hands. They never were. They never were. And as much as I didn't care whether I lived or died when I was out there using, it's like I did crazy stuff. Shouldn't even be here. But now I, I love my life. I, I have a, a quality of life. And um, you know, I'm grateful. I like the idea of doing a gratitude list in the morning. Because my, you know, that, that addiction thing that lives in my head it says, good morning, Donna, you're going to die today. <laughs> it says that to me a lot. No, but no, I'm not. I'm going to write a gratitude list today is what I'm going to do. Um, because that's a loud voice alone in the middle of the night. It gets loud. It gets real loud. And uh, so, you know, I believe my steps are ordered. I have a higher power and I'm, you know, right along the path. And God knew this was going to happen. And I thank God I'm in recovery for this to happen because if I was using my drug of choice, I'd blow my heart out because I wouldn't have known. If I hadn't really listened to my body is the other lesson. If I hadn't listened to my body and gone to the ER, I would not have known I had this. I just, and I wouldn't have known my blood pressure was not well controlled, which makes it worse. So, you know, God's all in this. So that's all I got. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. I'm Greg, and I'm a great recovering addict. Hi, Greg. And I'm glad to be here today, and I'm sort of like Karen. I used to pass by this shop and wondering, you know, what they talking about in there. But today, you know, I qualify. <laughs> you know, I, uh, when I came into the fellowship as a newcomer, I used to share that I'd never use again, no matter what. And I think around about 2006, I had a surgery on my appendix, and I had shared with my doctor that I was a recovering addict. So I woke up after surgery, and they had me hooked to this bottle. And they said, well, if you feel like you're hurting, push this button. Oh my God. I said, wait a minute, hold up. <laughs> So uh, I'm sitting there contemplating, now what this button going to do if I hurt? So I got the hurt, and I pushed the button. And a few seconds later, the pain went away. I said, hmm. Then I'm grateful for those addicts that told me early on, call your sponsor. Mm -hmm. So I got on the phone, and I called my sponsor. He knew I was in surgery, but he was working, but he was off. And he run out there, and I said, man, what's this stuff? So he told me what it was. He said, that stuff's so potent. When I was in Vietnam, you can lose a leg, yeah. and they can shoot it in your arm, and you'll never know you lost your leg. I said, oh, man. So we talked. So I got on the phone. I called the doctor. I said, hey, look at him. <laughs> Come and get this <laughs> bottle <laughs> of this stuff, <laughs> right? And let me see, can I bear this pain mm -hmm. on my own? And, and me and my sponsor, we prayed. And I asked my high power to help me to come through this. And uh, sure enough, I never had to push that button again. Mm -hmm. So that was my experience on that situation. And a few years ago, I got a phone call from my wife saying that my insurance, our in health insurance was going to be canceled if I didn't go to get a physical. So I went and took a physical 
And they called me back. I mean, they rushed back with the call like a day later. Look, you need to come in and talk to us. And I was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, man. And the type of cancer that they diagnosed me as an African American is is prominent. You know, it's like every you know everybody it just it just comes up on us. And man, I was man, it was like I had a death sentence. You know, and that's just how I felt. You know, oh man, I'm finna die. That was the first thing crossed my mind. I went all negative. I forgot about my high power. You know, and it was just me, 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 me. And uh, they told me I had cancer. So I went home and told my wife. She said, well, the first thing we need to do is find out what type of procedures that they have that they could do. And so we went in, and, and they told me what I had to do. So I just I took a procedure. I had prostate cancer. They say my PSA was 55. I said, 55? It was off the chart. So I went in, and I, I chose to do the radiation so many times of radiation, and then they put the seeds in, mm-hmm. and and I did that surgery. But I still had this thing about like what Karen was saying about it coming back, it coming back because I know so many guys that it came back on and they passed anyway, mm-hmm. right? So I was real grateful for those addicts in the rooms that were sharing with me what I found out was when you. See, they say we share our experience, strength, and hope. So you never went through this illness. It really, and they say, oh, I know how you feel. But you really don't know how I feel because you never experienced mm-hmm. what I'm going through. Mm-hmm. So I had to, so what I ended up doing, what I'm grateful for, that I could get on the phone and call an addict in Atlanta that had the same surgery I had and tell me the symptoms and all and how he came out and how he been doing. So I made a decision to do the C's. And so my wife kept complaining. I'm hurting, oh, I'm hurting, I'm hurting, I'm hurting, I'm hurting. And I said, well, you need to go to the doctor. She went to the doctor. She came back. She had ovarian cancer. I'm like, oh, man. So now we got two recovering addicts in the house with cancer. And it's like, you know, we, we both went in our own little world. We, instead of coming together, we sort of like separated. We was trying to, you know, I didn't want her to go with me to my treatments. I go by myself, I'm gonna do this by myself, I'm gonna do this, you know, and, and we just sort of like drew apart, you know, instead of coming together. And that's what I dealt with. But in the end, we ended up getting a divorce. What we found out was, in the end, the divorce didn't separate us. It didn't separate us. We was we we grew closer to, closer together, but you know I had a lot of regret that I did the divorce because she debate she based the divorce on me. You know, like you know this disease I got, I ain't able to do this for you, and I'm not able to do that for you, and you need to be happy, and you need to go on with your life. So she done gave herself a death sentence too, right? And so me not knowing at the time. <coughs> I said okay, but when I said okay, it looked like it just brought us close together. And she was the addict. She like had like 22 years at the time. I had 20, and uh, she, she had to go through all these surgeries. She first she had a surgery, and they operated, and it came back. And she was like she was one of those no drugs, no doc, you know, no this, no that, but. You know, the doctor had to sit down with me and her and tell us some things you're just going to have to take some medication. Some surgery that you have, if you don't take the medication, you can go into shock. Mm-hmm. And it'll make the procedure more complicated and you can actually die. So today I'm sitting here, when she was sharing, I don't take any medication. You know, I don't, nothing. I'm not on anything. But... My PSA has never gone to zero, but I always keep hope. And but what I'm most of all, I'm real grateful for those addicts, those addicts that came to my bedside, that was there with me, that was there with her. And when I heard when Karen was saying about a wheelchair, you know, I remember I wanted to take her. It was getting real serious, 
And I called all my kids together and I said, look, we need to take your mom. His mother, they coming up, let's take her down to Daytona. We rented a resume room for all the kids and everything. We borrowed a wheelchair from another recovering addict. They had a wheelchair that they wasn't using. And we took her down and had a good time on the beach. But it's the last day that I remember seeing her when they was giving her this medicine that I had. But she was laying in the hospice and she was so drugged up that she wasn't saying anything and the family members trying to make a choice on whether to give it to her or not. And I didn't have no power. You know, I didn't have.